What's up, Bass and Buddies? This is Mr. Bass, and I had a subscriber ask me uh, in the comments if I would go into detail about the swinging head jig, the swing head jig, or the biffle head. And so that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to kind of go in depth and talk a little bit about the biffle head or the biffle hard head or the swing head, swing head jig. Some people call it the rugby head. There's a lot of different names for it out there. But I will probably refer to it as the biffle head more than anything. Uh, Tommy Biffle is the guy who invented this technique. He's the one that's known for it. And I kind of jumped on the bandwagon as soon as he introduced it. He won a tournament or even maybe a couple of tournaments on it and it really got my attention and so I started fishing it right away and I've kind of been a Biffle head loyalist and I still prefer the Biffle head to the other swing heads out there. I'm not saying it's the best one, it's just the one I prefer. I will show you a couple of other options but I'm gonna talk, so when I say biffle head, I'm talking about swing, swing head, swinging head, jig, uh, interchangeably. So um, I've got some notes here that I'm gonna follow, so I may be looking down at these, but I will kind of walk through what I have learned, and a lot of this I learned from Tommy Biffle and uh, other fishermen, really, but for the most part, it's been trial and error experimentation based on duplicating what Tommy Biffle has done very successfully. So what is a hard head or what is a swinging head jig? This is it right here. And this is uh, Tommy Biffle's version. And he has a lot of different sizes. And his are a little different. They're all based on 16th of an ounce. So this is an 11 16th. I don't know how big it goes up to. The biggest size I have is the one ounce version. This is one ounce. You can kind of see how it compares. Uh, 11 16th is gonna be kind of close to probably three quarter ounce, I'd say, just guessing. Um, here is another head that I that I use probably more. This is the head that I use probably more than anything. This is the 7 16 ounce head. And if I remember correctly, this is Tommy Biffle's favorite head as well. So what's the big deal with weights and head sizes? What, what you're going to find is that the technique, in order for this to be effective, this is a bottom of the lake technique, similar to a crankbait. So this biffle head needs to travel along the bottom of the lake bed in order for you to be effective in catching fish. And so the proper weight for this bait depends on a couple of things. First and foremost, it depends on the depth of the water. The shallower the water, the lighter the head you can use. But Tommy Biffle says you want the heaviest head you can get away with because you want a lot of crashing and banging off of the bottom of the lake. You also want a hard bed, a hard bottom. So if you're fishing a real muddy reservoir, real muddy bottoms, this is not the technique for you because the uh, what makes this technique effective is the crashing and banging off of those rocks, just like a crankbait. How does a crankbait really work effectively? Grinding through the mud is not really that effective with a crankbait. You can catch a fish here and there, just like you can catch a fish here and there fishing this on um, mud bottoms, but there's really not what it's made for. You wanna be banging off of the rocks, and, and so you wanna find hard bottoms. He talks about, you know, look for shell beds, look for um, chunks of concrete, look, look for chunks of rock, look for hard ledges and hard bottoms. And, and, and then, you know, obviously look at the, at the um, obvious areas where fish are going to be traveling. 
and and concentrate there. You know, maybe off of a long point near near uh, shallow spawning flats and that sort of thing. There's a lot of places where you can find this, and you can fish it deep as well. The key is that if you're going to fish it deep, you got to have a bigger head. And bigger head, 11 sixteenths is the one that uh, Tommy Biffle throws when he gets in deep water. And then, of course, one ounce really deep. The other, So the other thing that's going to affect how heavy of a head you use is current. If you've got a really swift moving river, you're going to need a heavier head. Because what will happen if you have a lighter head, that current's going to lift your bait off the bottom and when you lose your bait when it comes off the bottom it loses its effectiveness so in current you're probably going to use a heavier head and this bait shines in fast moving water it really does so hard bottoms and lakes are fine but if you want if you've got hard bottoms and fast moving rivers that's another place that it shines so this is, this is a swing head jig, and why? Because you can see the head swings. It swings freely, and that's what, that's what makes it a swinging head jig. And this, of course, is an EWG uh, hook, extra wide gap hook that you attach the bait to. So that's what the, um, what the biffle head or the swinging head jig is. Now, you can also, if you don't want to buy a pre-made, uh, if you'd like to have more flexibility with the type of hooks, you know, maybe you don't like EWG hooks, or maybe you like to switch it up. Maybe you like straight shank uh, worm hooks or offset worm hooks or the EWG hooks, but in different sizes. Uh, biff the biffle heads are attached, permanently attached, so you got what you got. But you can buy just heads. This is... Uh, the rock jig and you can see that uh, it has this is made by all-terrain tackle and it just has a hook on there that you can you can thread I mean a, a loop on there that you can thread any hook that you want to on it here's another one uh, made by tungsten or made by uh, strike king it's tungsten so that's a question. Should you throw tungsten football heads for the swinging head technique? I really am not uh, that big of a fan. I don't really care to tell you the truth because tungsten is, you know, it's super dense. It's way more dense than lead. It, uh, it's super sensitive. You're gonna feel the bottom more. So you might say, well, why wouldn't you want it then if you're if this is a bottom bouncing technique? Well, the reality is it is gonna help you feel the bottom better, but is it worth the price? Is it worth the money? The hard heads are just lead. They're not made out of tungsten. And what I found is I can feel the bottom just fine using these lead heads. So I'm not gonna go with tungsten. There may be certain techniques, though, where the tungsten does help. You know, if you're in a really strong current, uh, uh, maybe a super windy day where the, you know, the waves are really rolling, maybe you need extra sensitivity. That might be when I might throw a tungsten head. But generally speaking, I don't think you need it. So that's just my thoughts on the material that you might want to use. So it's up to you what you want, whether you want a pre-made one here that's all rigged and ready to go, or you want to do your own hooks with your own heads. Either way is fine. The one thing that I would say is there are some companies that are going with uh, ball heads and maybe point, more pointy heads and other shaped heads. And I kind of believe that the football head is the best head out there, especially in rocks. It kind of deflects off the rocks better. It bounces out of the rocks better. And to me, I just think the football head in general is the best head to go with. In fact, Davey Height says he's pretty much totally replaced all of his football jigs. Doesn't, doesn't fish with standalone football jigs that much anymore at all. He just throws a hard head with the shape of a football head. So that's, that's the actual head. Now, equipment. What kind of equipment do you need to fish this technique? That's kind of an interesting question because 
as Tommy Biffle says, this is really a replacement for a crankbait. Anywhere you can throw a crankbait, you can throw this in place of it and it's gonna work. So crankbait rods are very flexible. They're usually a moderate taper, which means the taper bends through the whole rod so that the whole rod has a nice sweeping action. That kind of rod is not gonna work well for the hard head or the swinging head. For the swinging head jig, you need a stout rod. At least that's my preference, and, and that's what Tommy Biffle says. I think a lot of people would agree with him that you really want a stout head instead of, I mean, a stout rod. You, you really want a stout rod rather than a moderate sweeping rod. So I fish mine with the, the smaller jigs, and I will go down to the smaller, lighter heads than this, if the water's really shallow. Uh, but like I said, the problem is if you get too light, it's really hard to feel the bottom. But there are occasions where I've used a, a, a considerably lighter head than this. And when I use a lighter head, I go with a medium heavy uh, rod with a fast tip. But that's not my go-to rod. My go-to rod is a heavy. I throw a heavy rod with a fast tip. One of the rods that I like to use is the swim jig rod that um, Castaway makes, cut. So one of the rods that I like to use is the swim jig cut. So one of the rods that I like to use is the swim jig rod made by Castaway Rods for Bill Lowen. Uh, he's a big swim jig fisherman, and I tend to like that rod for swim jigs, and I also like it for these hard heads. I also have some flipping sticks that I will use, but generally speaking, I'm going to use a stout rod. So what I mean by that is the majority of the rod is very stiff. It's not going to have a lot of taper, and then fast, you're going to have some movement on the end to help you set the hook but I found you need a stout rod to really horse those fish in. So that's the rod that, that I go with almost always. I also tend to go with a little longer rod, like seven and a half foot long, up to maybe seven eleven. but normally I'm gonna go stick around with about seven and a half, sometimes a seven foot rod. Some people like a little shorter, some people like a little longer. I just personally like the longer rod better. I feel like I get more and better hook sets by going with that kind of middle of the road, seven and a half foot long, heavy flipping stick or heavy rod. So that's the rod. The reel, the reel needs to be a fast reel. And what do I mean by fast? I would not go any slower than a seven to one ratio reel. Now that they, uh, there's a lot more popular uh, fast cut. Now that there's a lot more high speed reels on the market, like in the eight ones and the nine ones, and maybe even the 10 ones, I would even go with a faster reel than the seven to one. So I would probably, and the reason I say would probably, I've pretty much used a seven to one up to this point, but I think this season I'm going to start trying out an eight to one because when the fish takes in this bait, you've got to reel up line really fast. And because the hook set is interesting, the hook set on, uh, or the bite, let's, let's go back and, and talk, talk about that. The bite on this, well, stop, cut. So the stouter rod is the rod that I'm going to use. And, uh, cut. Jeez, I'm screwing this up. All right. And action. So the reel I'm going to use is a high speed reel. And what do I mean by high speed reel? At least a seven to one gear ratio reel is what I'm going to go with. And really now that the, the prevalence of even higher gear ratio rods are, are out there, 
I probably would go with even something a little faster, like an eight to one, maybe even a nine to one, but there may be times when you've got to slow your hand, your turns down a, a tad if you go with a nine to one. But what Tommy Biffle says is, there is no such thing as too fast. The faster you can reel, the better, as long as it stays on the bottom. If you're starting to reel so fast that the bait comes up and you can't feel it touch the bottom anymore, you're going too fast. But the reason you need a high speed reel is because when they suck this bait in, you have to take up line very, very fast. And so a high speed reel is really important. And then what size line? Somewhere between, I'd say 15 to 20 pound test. There's only one problem with, with the heavier line. This technique is such that you really, most of the time, do need a heavy line. You're bouncing off the rocks and you're bouncing off shell beds and that kind of stuff, and you need a stout line. But the heavier the line, the harder it is to get the bait on the bottom. So for ease of technique, a lighter line would be better, but I really have not been able to find less than a 15-pound test to be worth my time. And usually I'm more in like the 17 pound range. I think Tommy Biffle throws 20 a lot of times, but don't quote me on that. I'm not positive. So somewhere around that, I always use fluorocarbon line. I know some people like to throw braid and they'll put a fluorocarbon leader. I hate using braid on a bait caster reel. I use braid on all my spinning reels, but I cannot stand it on a bait caster. So I'm never going to, I'm never going to go with, braid and I'm not going to go with mono because for this technique mono has too much stretch in my opinion. I want a line with less stretch that's going to be fluorocarbon. I don't care about the visibility factor. This is a high speed technique. Uh, visibility is not that crucial to me but fluorocarbon is invisible so fluorocarbon works fine. So recap on the gear. Heavy rod, fast action, fast reel, 15 to 20 pound uh, fluorocarbon line. That's the equipment. Now, um, let's talk about baits. So, cut. All right, so what baits should, should you use for this technique? Well, Tommy Biffle says you should use the Biffle bug, and I tend to agree with him. That's my favorite bait. I'll get to that one last. But Really, any beaver style bait is probably going to work fine. So one of the thoughts here is that you're trying to mimic a crawdad, uh, although it could be resemble a bait fish or, or, or something else flying through the water. But generally speaking, you're trying to mimic a crawdad. And it's a fleeing crawdad, you know, to, to create a reaction strike. So any beaver style bait is gonna work. It doesn't matter what the brand is, but I'm gonna show you a few that I have used or that I know that other people have used that tend to work. The first, of course, is the original beaver. And this is the Reaction Innovations Sweet Beaver. And what you're gonna to wanna to do with all of these baits that uh, you put on a biffle head is you're gonna to want to tear these appendages apart. They usually come attached. You're gonna to wanna to pull them apart so that you get more action in the water. You want a lot of action in the water. Although I have heard guys say, you don't want too much action, which is why maybe a brush hog or a creature bait that's got to all kinds of appendages may not be good. I've never tried it with a um, creature. I've never tried it with a creature style bait. I've always used beaver type baits. So the sweet beaver, you can't really go wrong with. It's gonna work well. Another one that I've had quite a bit of luck fishing uh, the biffle head with is, this is a Yum brand uh, beaver, and it's called a woolly bug. And if you look, it looks pretty darn similar, doesn't it? A lot of similarities here. Either of these work just fine. Another great beaver style bait is the Strike King Structure Bug. So this is a structure bug. And uh, you wanna tear these appendages loose, tear the, whatever this is, antenna loose. Make sure these are pulled apart. So you get a lot of flapping action. 
on all the sides of that. So another one that uh, Matt Allen says is his favorite that he loves to throw. This is made by Zoom Baits, and this is called the Z-Craw. And I only started fishing with the Z-Craw last year. It's a great flipping bait. It's great uh, for many techniques. I have not fished it on the Biffle head though. So I'm sure it works great though, if Matt Allen says it does. He knows a lot more than I do. So that's a bait. And then another one I like on some occasions is the old Yamamoto Flappin' Hog. And this thing has a lot of a pin. It's got two here, two here, two here, two here. The, the problem, the downside with the Yamamoto Flapping Hog is it's a typical Yamamoto bait. It tears up really quick, really fast. So I don't tend to use this much. I use it a lot on jig as a jig trailer when I can use slow techniques and uh, it preserves the bait longer. But it will work on a on a biffle hardhead as well. Here's another rage bait that works great. This is a little more subtle yet not. And what I mean by that is there's no appendages on the sides here. Uh, but these two uh, rage pinchers, which all of the rage baits have a have a edge, as you can see right there, on these. And because there's just two here you still get a lot of water movement, a lot of flapping action when you put this on the back of a hard head. And I've said this in some of my other videos, the Rage Menace is one of the most versatile baits on the planet. You can use this a hundred different ways. There's so many ways to fish it. And so I wanted to throw this in just to show you here yet again, the Menace will work on this technique. Okay, now I'm going to show you two other baits and, that are a little different. That uh, This one here, Davey Height likes to fish with, probably because he's sponsored by them, I don't know. But this is the Yamamoto Psycho Dad, or the Konami Bait Psycho Dad. And it's a slender profile craw. What makes it unique compared to these other baits, like say the beaver is, th these these claws, crawdad claws, if you will, are just flat and skinny. And they flap around, but they're not super buoyant. When you stop the bait, they're, they're gonna drop down. But the Psycho Dad's claws are buoyant. They're filled with air. And they will float up. So, Davey Height says this puts puts this lure in a, like a crawdad posture, in an, in an aggressive posture with claws up. And so he thinks it gets him more bites. Another advantage to this Psycho Dad is it has a hollow cavity inside that you can put a rattle in. And a rattle is a great idea. I use rattles on my hard heads. But I tend to, so that's a good bait. I tend to go with the old tried and true Tommy Biffle Biffle Bug made by Gene LaRue Bates. I still think it's the best. I just do. I, I'm sold on this. This is a crazy versatile bait. You can tear all these appendages off and just use it as a, a, as a flipping and pitching bait into thick, heavy cover. A um, couple of neat things, though, about the biffle bug it has these two flapper legs and they really they've got kind of a like a foot almost on the end of them and they really move water a lot the other thing that i like about it is it has a hollow cavity right here all the way down the length of the of the lure and you can place rattles in this. And th so this is what I use for my rattles. You can place rattles in this and it works fantastic. So that's my go-to favorite lure, the actual 
Biffle Bug. There's a ton of different colors out there. It's just an excellent lure. But any of these would work. Any of them are really great, to tell you the truth. So let me show you how to rig, rig this. You rig it like a, 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 a normal Texas rig. And you're going to just stick it in the in here and rig it just like you would a normal Texas rig. Now, one of the caveats here that I I probably need to point out, which so I'll pull this out and just show you here, is you want this head to swing to swing freely. So you've got to make sure that you don't put too much of your uh, plastic on here to inhibit or to get in the way of the movement of this head. So normally when you're texting, Texas rigging, normally when I do, I'll take this distance of the hook and I'll usually go all the way in before I come out. But when you're doing the, the hard head, you don't want to go that far in. So you want to maybe just go about half the distance of the hook and go in and then turn it so that, as you can see here, the head does not interfere with this at all. Still moves freely. It has to move freely. That's critical to the success of this prep technique. Okay, the other thing that you want to do with this is you, when you're rigging this, you want your soft plastic lure, you want the hook to go completely through it like that. So you don't leave the hook inside the bait. You, you stick it completely out. Now, if you're in an area where you're super worried about getting, getting snagged, you could text pose this like that so that it just pops down real easy but i don't do that at all there's actually a little channel in the biffle bug anyway and the hook will kind of sit in there just fine but i have found that if you bury this hook in here and sometimes even if you text pose it you're going to miss a lot of fish you want the hook to go clear clear through the bait and just stay up there now back to matt allen if you watch his videos on this he takes uh, pliers and bends this hook up, actually, even more. I've never done that, and I don't think I've ever needed to, but he se seems to think that you need to do that to really improve your hookup ratio. But for me, I've not had the problem, so I'm probably not going to worry about that. Okay, so that's the baits, and that's how you rig it. So how to fish it, that's kind of some of the last last thing to talk about. So I already mentioned you want hard pot, hard bottoms. So you've got to know where the hard bottoms are, which means you need to have a lake where you have experience on, or you've got to have good fish finders with structure scan, something that can help you identify the hard bottoms. Uh, that, that's what you need more than more than anything. Now, if you don't have fancy equipment, you can still fish with this and use it the same way we used to use a Carolina rig in the old days, which is use it as a search bait. Just throw it out there, let it drop to the bottom, crank and wind, and that, and you will start to learn. Whoop, right now I'm in the mud. I can feel I'm not on hard stuff. Go to a different spot. And, and as you experiment, that will help you locate and identify and learn about the bottom of your specific lake or pond. Most ponds in the area where I live are muddy, so this technique doesn't work that great when it comes to pond fishing for that, for that reason. But as I said before, rocky is best, hard bottoms, isol isolated rock piles too. So you might have a hard bottom, but if you find, have a big old long hard flat, then you want to look for isolated, isolated rock piles or, or shell beds or concrete pilings uh, or something hard on the bottom that's a little different that the fish will likely congregate to and that's what you should target so you just chuck it out there let it hit the bottom uh, once it hits the bottom 
just start creeling. Just a nice steady retrieve. And what you want is as fast a retrieve as you can get uh, and still touch the bottom. You should feel it ticking off the bottom. Tick, 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 tick. Bouncing and ticking and bouncing off the bottom. If that stops, if you if you can't feel it anymore, it means you're, you're reeling too fast. The baits come up. All you do is just stop, let it drop back to the bottom, then start over. And after a while, you'll be able to figure out the cadence and the speed that you need to do to keep it on the bottom. And as long as it's bouncing off the bottom, you're going to get bites. So the hook set's a little different because when they strike, it's not a big wham. It's not a real hard slam usually. A lot of times it feels soft, it feels mushy, or you just feel weight. And so you'll be going along and all of a sudden there's just this mushy feeling or this kind of this, you know, kind of a, a weight on. And when that happens, you don't want to stop reeling. You want to keep reeling. And then I kind of describe it as the Carolina rig uh, hook set. It's a sweeping hook set. So it's not over your head. It's gradual to the side. But I, I, I guess maybe I should say something there. It's not gradual in that you just have a nice, easy, you got to horse it, you know, but you got to go to the side. It's got to be a sideways, sideways, um, hook set. But when you feel them kind of, when you feel that mushy feeling, you keep reeling and, and you'll, you'll realize, okay, yep, I got him. He's on there. And then you can do that sweeping hook set and, and you'll land him. Uh, one last thing on that is Tommy Biffle says that, and, and I kind of follow him as well. Once I cast it out and let it drop, I keep my rod tip kind of down. I don't point it straight down, but I point it down around that four o'clock position or that uh, on the other side would be like a seven, eight o'clock position, somewhere around, around there is so kind of a downward angle. And that kind of helps you when you have to do this sweeping motion to set the hook a little easier. So that's pretty much it. That, in a nutshell, is all I know about the swinging head jig or the biffle hard head. It's a great technique. It's a lot of fun. And you will catch fish with it. And sometimes it will just be incredible how many fish you can catch. So... I would really encourage you to try it if you've not tried it. I hope you found this informative and you enjoyed it. If so, please subscribe, please share, and please share with me your favorite ways to fish the Biffle Hardhead. With that, I hope you have a great cut. So this is Mr. Bass saying... What is this? Let's see here.